All right, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. Thank you so much for being with us. I want to welcome all of you that are being here. We've got hundreds of guests that have joined us tonight, both on Zoom and on YouTube. So thank you very much for being here. I want to thank Wayne State University Press for being our event partner. Their ongoing support of Dr. Stern and their guidance on publishing his memoir, Invisible Ink, is the reason we're able to hold this very meaningful program and celebration. As you know, Wayne State University Press is a distinctive urban publisher committed to supporting its parent institution's core research, teaching, and service mission by generating high quality scholarly and general interest works of global importance. And the press is internationally recognized for its list in Jewish studies. Within the broad category of Judaic studies, the press has published numer numerous works about the experience of Jews in Europe before, during, and after the Holocaust, of which Dr. Stearns is the most recent entry. If you're watching tonight on Zoom, you can click on the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen and ask a question and we'll try to work it into the uh, event um, or try to answer them at the end of the program. I now wanna introduce Rabbi Mike Moskowitz. Rabbi Moskowitz grew up in St. Louis and attended Duke University. He was ordained at the Hebrew Union College and while in Cincinnati, he met his wife, Leslie. An active member of the Jewish community and also with the Board of Rabbis here in Michigan. Rabbi Mike has served as a rabbi in Temple Shir Shalom in West Bloomfield since 1995. Rabbi Moskowitz. Thank you, Rabbi Merfeld, for inviting me and in, in including me in this special evening and being a part of this. I appreciate that too. It truly is an honor to be here with such esteemed and respected scholars this evening. Dr. Michael Berenbaum is a writer, lecturer, and teacher consulting in the conceptual development of museums, such as the United States Holocaust Memorial Center, Illinois Holocaust and Educational Center, and the Dallas Holocaust and Human Rights Museum. His work on numerous historical films in multiple languages has earned more than a dozen Emmys and four Academy Awards. Dr. Berenbaum is the director of the Siggy Ziering Institute exploring the ethical and religious implications of the Holocaust at the American Jewish University, where he's also a professor of Jewish studies. Renowned scholar of the Holocaust, Dr. Berenbaum is the author and editor of 22 books and hundreds of journalistic pieces. Of course, the reason we're gathering tonight is Dr. Guy Stern. Dr. Stern was born in Germany and emigrated to the United States in 1937. He served in the US Army earning the rank of Master Sergeant and was decorated with a Bronze Star. After the war, Stern earned graduate degrees in German studies and pursued an academic career both as professor and an academic administrator. An active lecturer and writer, Stern's traveled widely. He has returned often to Germany, received the Grand Order of Merit of the Federal Republic of Germany in 1987, the French Knight of the Legion of Honor Award, and the Ovid Award from Penn International Center of German Writers Abroad in 2017. Today, at the youthful age of 99, Dr. Stern is the Holocaust Memorial Center's director of the Harry and Wanda Zeckelman International Institute of the Righteous, a distinguished professor emeritus in the Department of Classical and Modern Languages, Literature, and Cultures at Wayne State University, and the secretary of the Kurt Weill Foundation. For me personally, I have the privilege of studying Torah weekly with Dr. Stern and with his wife, Susanna. And I'm always amazed at his insights, reflections, and contextual connections made as we delve into the text. Whether it's a reference to a teaching from one of the prophets or maybe something from the libretto of a 19th century German opera, or even the theologies of Nietzsche or Buber, I am constantly inspired and in awe. His steel trap mind and perspective engage even the most learned. And you should know, it is not only humbling to be in the presence of such greatness, but I sort of feel like I made it. If you only judge me by the company I keep, all is good for the fact that Dr. Stern calls me his rabbi. Well, like I said, I made it. Of all the accolades of which I've been blessed, few compare to being in the company of this great man. 
It's a blessed thing that tonight we get to celebrate Dr. Stern's latest writing, his autobiography. And of course, a friend of Dr. Stern's is very much a friend of ours. And so we are doubly blessed. He's asked of his good friend and colleague, Dr. Berenbaum, to share in this once in a lifetime occasion. So I now present Dr. Michael Berenbaum and Dr. Guy Stern. friend of uh, Dr. Stern's, and consequently, with your permission, Dr. Stern, I will call you Guy throughout, because we are longtime friends, uh, and therefore, we have to go easily. And this is an evening to celebrate you and what an incredible life you've had, but I don't want to make it easy for you. I want to push you a little bit. My first question uh, is a very simple one. Um, you waited until you are four score and high uh, to write your autobiography. That took a little bit of chutzpah. Uh, I would ask it in one of two ways. Why did you wait so long? Or how come you did it this early in your life? Don't you have another chapter to live, another chapter or two to live? But let's, let's grapple with that. Well, uh, Michael... Welcome to you and welcome to all my fellow panelists. And uh, I will start with a correction of that wonderful introduction. I got four score and eight and four score and five. Yes, I am 98 years old. Please, uh, Rabbi, don't make me older than I am, <laughs> even by one year. Okay, I'll answer your question, uh, Michael. And uh, I cheerfully accept the appellation of being a chutzpah pornum. <laughs> and uh, uh, I think I've been called that even in my youthful years at home. So I'll, I'll take that. But I uh, was not that confident in my longevity, but rather, I was a reluctant dragon, and the, I have to explain that. I, I didn't really at one time feel that my life deserved all that exposition, and so I stayed away, and I must say many colleagues urged me to do that. Foremost, my friend at, Brist at Princeton, Walter Hinderer, and he, he tried it first with kind words and as of lay, and then finally he started heckling me, started mild inf, uh, insults. And so that worked with me. And the last straw was, he said, uh, a guy, I just heard that our little appreciated uh, colleague is writing his biography. And I said to him, As you mean that? And then I used an appellation not fitting for this audience, especially since we have at least three rabbis in the audience. And so I have to be careful. But I said that, and then uh, I have to uh, say here, I used a expletive borrowed from human anatomy, and that really did it. And I said, well, if that uh, Nudnik can, uh, wants to write a, uh, um, an autobiography, then probably I have a few things to say. And well, I, I think we all, um, any of us who have read the book, will agree you have uh, more than a few things to say. Uh, I'm intrigued by another uh, part of the book, which is uh, you may have been called many names in your life, but I don't believe anybody ever called you invisible, at least not in the uh, probably uh, 40 years that I've known you. You're a highly visible person. How did you choose the title Invisible Ink? 
And the other question about that is what titles did you leave on the cutting room floor? Yes, I, I started out choosing uh, uh, two other titles, rejected them. Uh, one was Chance Encounters and the, the other one was of life, love, laws and literature. And uh, it's a euphony uh, convinced me. And then I thought of something that really regulated and determined my life. And that was the, eve the early evening of January 31st, 1933. My father took uh, my brother, five years younger, Werder, uh, into our best room, which he rarely did. And he said, I want to talk to you boys. What the news that you all have heard is bad, but uh, I have some advice to give you. Don't stick out or you'll get stuck. And he said, I want you to be almost invisible, invisible ink until the time comes that the invisible ink may become visible again. And that was number one, the right advice in a threatening, at a threatening moment in our lives. And secondly, it was also a heavy baggage to carry around because it meant that we had to suppress our own ego, our own personality, and uh, that became almost second nature. So even when the time came in America that you could divest yourself of that baggage, that you uh, could say, okay, uh, I'm free, but it's only happened in slow stages. And finally, when I wrote this autobiography, I think I diminished it to almost imperceptibility. I think we would, I think we would agree with that. Take us for a moment to your uh, childhood. Uh, tell us a little bit about your family. We're going to take people uh, a little bit through the book, so we get a chance to uh, deal with um, uh, guys' um, life. I would say long life, but uh, guys' life. And part of uh, what we're going to do with that is um, many of you know Guy a little bit later in life. So let's go to the early life and to the part of your of his career that we don't quite know. Tell us to take us to your your family for a moment and uh, describe the home you grew up in and what your father did and uh, your brother, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Yes, uh, my my parents. Were, uh, were really didn't look as if they were destined to meet because they came out from different parts of Germany and they both very came from rural in environments. And that meant that communications at that time between these small villages was next to in, in, inoperable. So uh, but they meant, uh, met through the courtesy of a salesman, uh, my uh, grandfather who died early on my father's side. Uh, my grandfather had a small clothing and apparel store and a salesman came to him and told my father the promising helpmeet of my uncle Herman uh, listen, there's a good job opening in the city of Floto, which my father at that time had probably never heard before, of heard of before. And so what happened, my father uh, applied and got the job in Floto for the biggest department store in that renowned little village. And uh, so dad was working one day as star salesman, and in came a 
woman by the name of Hedwig, the apple of the eye of my uh, grandfather. And the two uh, met, so to speak, well, word by word over the counter. And that's, uh, and that is how uh, my life started. And then they moved to a even better job of my father. He finally opened his own store and into that young couple uh, devoid of any funds except for, for the mid gift, which means the uh, dowry that my mother had and worked their way up step by step. And that was the background. My mother keeping the household, later three children to take care of and helping my father in the store as his um, assistant in the store and also of keeping the records and all that. So it was a family that pulled itself up by its own boots. Now Guy, uh, you told our uh, audience that uh, your father spoke to you on January 31st, 1933, which is obviously one day after Hitler came to power. What are your memories of living under Nazism and what are your most vivid memories now, which what are we, we're now, uh, since 1933, we are now um, uh, 80, uh, 33 and 67, we're 87 years away from that. What are your most vivid memories of living under Nazi Germany? What uh, you meant, what did it mean to live through that? What did it mean to you? You were young, you were a relatively young child, you were uh, 12, 13, 14. I can best tell that by remembering that evening uh, when the whole life changed. And that was that uh, I, my brother in law, in my brother and I really kept a low profile. And it also meant that an estrangement took place between the close friends we had in the neighborhood and that we had to. Uh, be aware that people started to look at us in a strange way. That was just the start. And then uh, we heard some vile remarks from our former good friends and fellow students. And finally, some of us got attacked. We had three students in the same uh, year, a a Jewish students. And uh, slowly uh, it, it became worse and worse, deteriorating relationships and your best friends could turn suddenly in your worst, into your worst enemies. Now, how did you come to the United States? Yes, uh, uh, let, we, were, we were living in a provincial town in northern Germany called Hildesheim. And uh, we were even less prepared for what happened because the town had a sort of image of being ecumenical, even uh, divided into Catholics and Protestants on an even basis in a small Jewish community. And we had the town seemed truly integrated. So what came on that evening that I wanted to tell about was a was absolutely devastating because there were signs even down with Jews on that earliest day of Nazi takeover. This is what and, when did, and when did your folks decide to send you to the US, to the United States? Uh, they, uh, uh, my mother, by a sort of accident, had a brother in the United States who lived in St. Louis with his wife and children and he had been banished 
in the in those patriotic days, patriarchal days, I mean, uh, because uh, he was uh, he was sassy to his father, my grandfather, and so he was banished. Where did you say bad boys? Possibly in everybody's family. Uh, you sent him to the United States, and my uh, grandfather had a brother in St. Louis. That's where he was shipped off to, and this accident of his sassiness and rebelliousness resulted that I had a mainstay in St. Louis. My parents immediately um, wrote to him, intensified their correspondence to him, asking him whether he could vouch for the family. And when that uh, proved impossible because of his finances, of my uncle's finances, uh, they said, could you take our eldest son? He possibly could find the means to get all of you over here. And that's how the resolution was made to send me to St. Louis. Now you had a favorable consul, um, uh, American consul. During this time, American consuls were setting up paper walls, making it impossible for Jews to come to the United States. And yet you were going to your uncle who was an unemployed baker. Yes. Uh, and uh, tell us for just one moment about that story because we should recall uh, uh, an American consul who uh, asked you and we should ask you the same question. Uh, what is the sum total of uh, 48 and 52? I still know that. <laughs> Even uh, as I approach the age of senility, I still know that. So uh, uh, I, uh, I, 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 it was a surprising question because we knew, of course, in the Jewish communities all over Germany, how the treatment by the American Foreign Office was going to be. They had orders almost as strict as the Canadians, uh, none would be too many. And so they put uh, trick questions, anything that would disqualify any one of the Jewish community from immigrating to the US. And I well, I didn't know this, that, for example, the council in Stuttgart was a strict, a strict anti-Semite and obeyed every slight ruling against a Jewish would-be immigrant. And uh, in, in addition, uh, I, there were very few who really sympathized with us. I got to uh, I got to Hamburg, where the nearest consulate was located, better than in Stuttgart, of course. And here, the vice consul was Malcolm C. Burke. And later on, when I read, uh, tried to figure out why he was so indulgent of me as a youngster, I found out that he was listed as one of the truly exceptional humanists and tried to make it as, uh, try to accommodate us as much as he could. So he was this is, uh, in, uh, in a book uh, called, uh, uh, called The Immigration to the United States. He is listed there in several editions. I want, I want the audience to appreciate um, a little bit of what they're hearing. Um, there's a, a word in Hebrew, udmitz mutzal meyesh, a brand plucked from the fire. So far, it's the sassiness of your uncle who got banished, your uncle going to St. Louis, your uncle who was unemployed, but the union vouched for him. A good consul general, we're going to skip over the role of the uh, Jewish children's program, the German Jewish children's program. And this is the way in which you um, 
uh, this is the way in which you come to the United States. Let's uh, skip through. I'll just give the audience a sense of chapters. You then have a chapter on what it's like to be an immigrant. You go to high school in St. Louis. You learn a little bit about baseball. You take up what is your first career, which is uh, a career in which you have great um, uh, great uh, skill. You become a busboy and then a waiter. And in fact, you, be, you remain a waiter for uh, much of your undergraduate and uh, uh, career. Uh, but then we'll move a little bit forward. You're taken into the army of the United States, Private Stern. Uh, and uh, uh, you then have this most unusual experience as Private Stern when you become a member of the Ritchie Boys. Tell the audience who the Ritchie Boys are and I'm going to ask you a couple of quick questions on that because it's such a, 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 an incredible experience. Yes, it is that. And uh, I, I tell you, I, I raced through those stages that you just mentioned. I became, I, I have to mention what, one significant event in my school days when I it was uh, when I was enrolled five days after my arrival in Soldan High School of our neighborhood, I uh, was really surprised. The principal interviewed me and oriented me. Today, that would be rather a, a great reception and would be so noted. But then I did get through high school. Uh, everything worked out. I uh, then uh, came the came the war and Pearl Harbor, and I tried to enlist in the U.S. Naval Intelligence because of an ad that uh, appeared on the walls of the college that I had reached in the meanwhile, uh, St. Louis University. Uh, if you have skills uh, for specialty work in the army, like knowing the enemy's language, habits, uh, and uh, idiosyncrasies, uh, let us get a look at you, come to the recruiting station of the Navy. Uh, I went down to Midtown St. Louis and I was ready to take part in the war. And to much to my surprise, they said, yes, you have good qualifications, but I, ex but I detect, said the ensign uh, recruiting us, uh, I detect an accent in your uh, uh, questions and answer game, in this question and answer game. Uh, were you born in this country? And I said, no. He said, can't use you next. <laughs> and uh, that, until the draft became general, uh, I uh, stayed out of the armed services, then was drafted into the army um, and acquired a new accent at Camp Barkley, Texas. And uh, so uh, that was my basic training. And then I uh, was called to company headquarters one day and the uh, master sergeant said, uh, uh, Private Stern, you're being transferred. And I said, yes, sir. Uh, uh, were two. He said, can't tell you military secret. And I said, you, yeah, oh, okay. And he said, yes, but you can open your orders when you are on the train for three hours. You will know where you're going. And uh, uh, Private Stern, uh, you will be going to your destiny and you'll soon find out what we have in mind for you. So you end, you end up. Um, I end up in camp. You end up at Camp Ritchie in Maryland. Yes, yes, and yes, and uh, I arrived after a, a train ride 
and they discovered some people who seemed to be on the same mission, all of them with the same accent. And uh, we got to a rail station in um, West Virginia, were picked up by trucks. And there we ended up at a camps, uh, at a camp entrance with the designation uh, Camp Ritchie Military Intelligence. And then soon found out that we had been selected for service with the uh, with, uh, MIS, Military Intelligence Service. And there started my career, if you want to call it that, as a, uh, as a member of PWI Team 41, uh, located in glorious Blue Mountains, Maryland, and that's where I started. Yes. Let's push. Let's push you forward a little bit, very quickly. You become trained as an interrogator. You're sent over to Europe. You're involved in D-Day uh, plus three. You're in the third day after D-Day. You arrive and then you're involved in intelligence. By the way, we have to say that in World War II, uh, normally they speak about military intelligence and my generation regards it as an oxymoron, as a contradiction, military intelligence. But military intelligence in World War II made grace, great use of your talents because you knew German culture, German language, German civilization, and you became an interrogator. But uh, part of what gives the book the great charm is you are a sassy interrogator. I want you to touch on two stories, and we're going to go over a little bit of, uh, of our allotted time, but you got to hear this story. Tell us uh, about uh, you as a mad Russian. And then tell us about your most important uh, capture that almost got you court martial. My most, uh, my uh, uh, my most important invention in the early days of after arriving by a PT boat on the shores of Normandy, being scared like everybody else. Our training started immediately. Uh, in uh, what we had been trained to do in Camp Ritchie. And I put it in action because uh, one, of our, uh, one of our fellow soldiers was interrogating away about a, a few uh, yards away. And he said, get over here, Stern. We have too many prisoners. So I rushed over there and within 10 minutes of arriving at, in uh, Normandy, I was faced with a, by a terrible soldierly um, non-com of the enemy. And he was an artillery sergeant and refused to answer any of my questions. He knew the security rules established by the Geneva Convention and didn't talk. And within moments, I felt I was going to be a huge failure. And then something happened, sent not from heaven, uh, rabbis, uh, but from an artillery shell came over and both of us hit the mud and uh, I uh, got up immediately after the shell had hit good distance away from us and he was still on the ground. And I said, uh, get your uh, anatomy, uh, pardon, it's a euphemism, uh, get your anatomy uh, 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 up and he then must have made, drawn the inference that I was completely fearless, but it was just ignorance. And uh, I got a fairly decent uh, interrogation after, out of him then. And my contribution then, after having done all these uh, uh, first 
a swoop of interrogations, I uh, had to invent a method not taught at Camp Ritchie. And that was the invention of Commissar Krukov, alias, <laughs> alias Sergeant Guy Stern. And that came about the following way. We had a replacement named of Fred Howard come in. He was supposed to get, extract target information from the German prisoners. And that was inf infinitely more difficult than a standard uh, interrogation. And so uh, Fred was turned down by every prisoner because even the dumbest uh, were, was aware if we asked for the landmarks of a factory or the a real tra traffic going to the factory of questions that precise, he, he uh, knew we were going to bomb uh, the living daylights out of that factory. So he shut up. So uh, Fred Howard asked me, hey, you have been in this long, Fred was a replacement. He said, uh, you have been here much longer than I, what would scare these Germans? That was one of the methods we haven't tried. And I said, the slogan, Sieg oder Siberian, victory or Siberia, and uh, which meant they were all going to be shipped to the Soviet Union and into Siberian landscapes. So they were scared, really scared, so and everybody, let me just interrupt. Uh, what what every German knew is you would much rather get captured by the Americans than by the Russians. Uh, absolutely. Uh, so uh, they felt they were in fairly uh, decent surroundings, even though it was a mud hole at first or prison of war camp. And then... Uh, Inventing, and then Fred said to me, well, let's get a Ruski here. And I said, well, no, they're few at uh, Supreme Headquarters, but not in the lower echelons. And so uh, I, uh, I said, well, let one of us turn himself into a Russian. I, uh, we, uh, uh, approached our commander, Captain Rust, and asked him whether it was uh, possible. Also, Captain uh, Khan, who was a fellow refugee like us, he was completely understanding. He said, try it. So uh, I exchanged unif uh, uh, worn out uniform parts of uh, fatigues and others with Russian freed prisoners, got parts of their uniform, took away from Germans who had taken it as trophies, decorations from Russian soldiers, and pinned them all over my, uh, my uh, uniform. I must have looked like Hermann Goering. Uh, and uh, then they took me for Commissar Krukov, as a sign set on my interrogation tent in three languages. And my God, it worked like a charm. It, uh, we, we could uh, imit, we, I put a Russian accent into my German, learned at the Eddie Cantor show, a popular comedy show in America, which also featured a side job or side role of, uh, of a mad Russian. And I took that on, Presented. helped Fred in a dual encounter with the prisoner, uh, Fred playing the soft-hearted American, uh, all sympathy for the poor prisoner, and I became the rough, tough Sergeant Krukov, Imitate. who had... Uh, which bouts of uh, uh, bad temper that would have shattered a glass. Give the cost. I'm going to ask one more question and um, tell us about the other great story 
uh, about uh, capturing uh, Hitler's latrine, latrine orderly. Latrine officer. Uh, yes, yes, and yes. Well, uh, uh, we uh, it, we had just uh, weathered the Battle of the Bulge, and uh, there was a time for a little bit of fun and games. So Captain Khan called. And we should know that after the Battle of the Bulge, we understood that America was going to win the war. The only question was when. And the other is, which one of the American soldiers is going to be alive to see the end? Yes. Their assessment. Good, I, I continue. Yes, and you gave a salient part of my story. And uh, so uh, we had uh, turned me into Commissar Krukov. Fred and I worked together, and we broke prisoners who seemed utterly unbreakable. And that, of course, reached uh, headquarters. Uh, I was put in charge of uh, an interrogation unit, and we worked, Fred and I, soft-hearted American. Uh, and uh, then uh, and then we, I was called into Captain Khan again, and he said, look, we got here a little satire of, that the Canadians to our right flank have devised on our interrogation methods. And it was really funny. They had a good sense of humor. And uh, he said, uh, why don't you two, it was uh, Sergeant Henry Hecht from New York and I who were given that assignment. He said, think of something funny. And that meant humor on command. And so somewhat flabbergasted, uh, we walked out of his tent. And then uh, we said, what the heck can we think of? And then we, in front of my interrogation tent, uh, a prisoner was already waiting, a, uh, uh, a, a corporal. And he uh, was uh, standing, he was alternating the foot he was standing on and uh, obviously awaiting quickly a, an interrogation because uh, the call of nature seemed upon him. And so uh, it either it was uh, Henry, Henry Hecht or I who said, what, what do you think? We make this lowly corporal, we'll make him Hitler's latrine orderly. And then that was the breakthrough. We spun out a story of uh, dimensions that had everybody up and down the line uh, in stitches. And so uh, that story, as a joke was attached to our daily reports, about 40 were sent out to all units. Uh, we attached, we were allowed to attach that joke to that, and everybody laughed, except for he, uh, he was a nephew of a famous general, I won't give his name away, and he took it all for for absolute high intelligence. And uh, he said uh, he immediately called his headquarters in Washington. And he said, I don't know whether our sergeants can, co uh, can cope with this case. We would need an expert on the Fuhrer. And we, in, in the meanwhile, had dreamt up what intelligence he had, something involving part of his... You can, you can say it. Hitler, Hitler had a deformed scrotum, according to this report. <laughs> yes, you, you read... Only, only, army, only army men could really enjoy playing with that all the way through. And yes. nobody could have imagined it was serious except the, what we call in Yiddish, the Chacham from the Manishtana. <laughs> Manishtana is good, yes. And uh, so uh, I, we are... Uh, so we uh, 
I got a call. There was a fellow ex-student from St. Louis University in headquarters as a communications expert. And uh, I so like the young man who is now doing the same job for us down uh, to have us communicating. And he called me at midnight duty. And he called me, he said, Guy, the fat is in the fire. This fool, W, I'll go that far, uh, is, has just phoned for reinforcement in intelligence for the story on Hitler's latrine orderly. So we got scared. What if a high ranking officer came over and found out it was all <laughs> an ill placed joke? So uh, first we covered our proverbial and dug a ditch with our orders from Captain Can to write something like that were uh, contained. And uh, therefore we were covered. We were acting on orders if a court martial should come. But we then woke up Captain Can, was right after midnight. And uh, so he woke up his superior uh, uh, and, and he went all the way up to Colonel Dixon, the commander of us all. And uh, they uh, recommended to this, uh, this <laughs> deceased <laughs> and said, uh, have those orders canceled that an officer would come here. He did. And the joke went on. And then a final stage in this story of Latrine Orderly, Joachim Stahler, as we named him after that uh, corporal who had given us the inspiration by his incontinence. And uh, so uh, I, in, in, in my more sedate years as a professor writing on exile studies. I came home one evening with a whole stack of book, books that I had not read on exile had come out recently. And I found an entry by uh, two British intelligence officers. And uh, when my uh, wife, Judy, came home she found me rolling on the floor because these two experts had said the most interesting case that came to their team were, was the story of Joachim Stahler, the latrine orderly of Hitler and his uh, imperfect body. Uh, Guy, let me uh, interrupt you. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we have gone through 20... Um, two years of Guy's life. And um, I, I want to say that I, I want insisted on doing this because I presume that very few of you knew anything about this period of time. Uh, let me just uh, say we're going to accept questions from everybody else. And then I'm going to ask one question at the end. So um, Rabbi, you're supposed to hit us uh, with some questions now. If I understand correctly, or do you want me to take them off the chat or off the Q and A? So we can. Um, good evening, everyone. Ellie Mayerfeld here. So, uh, Rabbi, we've got uh, a couple of questions here. First one is someone asked um, about the challenges immigrating to the United States. Stacy is asking if Dr. Stern can comment on the most challenging thing he faced emigrating to the United States. Yes. I, uh, the uh, uh, the uh, most important thing was bringing my parents and my uh, my uh, siblings over, and I almost succeeded. And we had been given a pro bono lawyer of the Jewish community to help in any case where it was getting serious. I had found a gentleman by hitchhiking to work as a as a busboy uh, who when I told him my story and I turned the conversation to that 
he said, oh, what's needed to bring your family over? And I told him what guarantees and affidavits it was called, uh, you would have to provide uh, for guaranteeing that they would not become a public charge. And Let me interrupt for one second. Hear that, ladies and gentlemen. You have that same qualification today, which is the LPC document likely to become a public charge, which means you needed sponsorship of somebody who could afford to support them so they wouldn't go on public assistance. I'm sorry, I just want to let you continue the story. Yes. And so he said, well, I could do that. I almost, as we were racing down Delmar Boulevard in his very attractive car, uh, I, uh, I said, oh my God, and I almost was tempted to hug him. We met with this lawyer on the following weekend and this uh, lawyer was one of those uh, every comma counts in government regulations. And he said at the very beginning, he, inter he interrogated or rather questioned this gentleman and he said, uh, what's your profession? And he said, I'm a gambler. And the lawyer said, well, uh, the US government def definition of an affidavit giver is a respectable established person. And uh, so we can stop right here. I, I didn't know the word euphemism at that time, but I threw in the conversation, can't we just say he's a businessman? And the lawyer drew himself up, put down his fountain pen and said, and deceive the US government. On that note, this uh, gentleman left and that was my one sort of solid chance to get my parents and siblings out. And somebody being that prim and proper was the difference between life and death. Exactly. And he was ignorant of what was going on, possibly also the fault of our newspapers at the time. But he was absolutely, absolutely oblivious to the life and death struggle that you mentioned, that people in Germany were fighting as, a, as their last chance to get out. And that is the story, end of that story. And it, each time I tell it, I, I get indignant and uh, close to tears. Ellie? I want to reference Corey Harbaugh asked the question, uh, if Dr. Stern can speak from his own life experience about the circumstances we're currently in during the COVID pandemic. And I would direct people to our website at holocaustcenter.org where there's a essay, if you click on the blog section um, from Dr. Stern on just that topic. So I'd encourage everyone to look on our website at holocaustcenter.org uh, slash blog or click on it in the, on the homepage uh, to read Dr. Stern's essay on exactly that topic. Um, I think we have time for um, another question. Um, do, uh, actually, uh, Dr. Berenbaum, if you could sort of introduce the answer here. The, the estimate by the US government on what the contribution was of the Ritchie boys to the war effort. And then Guy, um, you, you've certainly given us quite a bit of experience on it, but Dr. Berenbaum, if you can comment first. Yeah, um, first of all, Ellie, my name is Michael to you as well. Uh, let me say that, that uh, we have to recognize something absolutely important, which is that the American government realized, and not only American government, but Australia realized it and uh, Great Britain realized it, that they had an asset in these uh, men and women. And the asset is that they knew German culture, German language and the like. And consequently, they led the some advanced intelligence units. They led the interrogation efforts. They also became uh, mayors of uh, of uh, cities under occupation. 
uh, Henry Kissinger, for example, who was then Heinz Kissinger, son of Orthodox Jews, and who said when we interviewed him on this, said uh, it was the first time he had uh, spoken to um, uh, two boys without an accent, and he had to learn the multiple accents of that. He was a mayor of a city under, um, under occupation. So their contribution was to be advanced intelligence unit interpre interpreters. They were interrogators. They were interrogators at the Nuremberg trials. And if you think of the following, you'll begin to understand what we did as Americans. We had a thousand people in the embassy in Iraq and we had only one native Arabic speaker which is we did not make use during the war on Iraq of all of the skill and talents. And I live in Los Angeles, which has 40,000 native Farsi speakers who are against the Iranian regime because they've been exiled from Iran. And the CIA keeps going and searching for people who speak Farsi without recruiting in the Persian Jewish community in the United States. So it's, a, it's a, an appalling lack of imagination uh, by what in other wars we call military intelligence as an oxymoron. Imagine the talent, and uh, I don't have time for a guy to describe what the men uh, that he served with became, how prominent, how preeminent, how creative, how imaginative. I want to ask you one question though, Guy, which is that um, it's, and I want to encourage everybody to read the book. It's a wonderful book. It is uh, serious. It is funny. It is extremely well written. It is cultured. It is, and a guy has the skill of a raconteur and everything else. But I want to ask you the, the major question, which is you were exiled from Germany, and yet um, you spent your life and you left Germany as a relatively speaking young boy, age 15. And yet you spent your life in a very dramatic way dealing with German literature. You had multiple contacts with Germany. Uh, you spent time there, you taught there, you were one of the first to teach in East Germany after the reunification. How come you didn't come out of that furious and angry and um, detesting anything to do with Germany. And instead you uh, really dealt with that. And let me just add another twist, which is you made an incredible contribution to what we have to call exile literature, which is the Germans who left Germany, but continued to write in a language they loved and the culture they admired despite all that had happened. Let me let you do that as the wrap up question. Yes. And uh, actually, uh, Michael, uh, it, it was not an easy decision to make. I had gone into graduate school as, as, a, as a candidate for PhD as in comparative literature. And German was to be part of it, but certainly not the paramount and exclusive one. So, uh, I got advice from two sources. Uh, our department head uh, called me into his uh, office one day. I was at Columbia. And uh, he said, you know, I get, I'm getting very good reports for, uh, about you. I think you have a real, or, or the faculty thinks, you have a real gift for German studies, and uh, we would we would like to keep you here in our department uh, if you so decide. That was one piece of advice. These were qualified and well-meaning uh, professors at Columbia, and then when my uh, when when my uh, relatives, the few that remained. I heard about this, they said, you can't do that. You know, that's, uh, how can you do that after what happened to our family? 
And uh, so I had to weigh the two pieces of advice. And as a conclusion I came to is, number one, I had learned of the few people in Germany and elsewhere who had helped the threatened Jewish population. They were very valiant and heroic people. And I could verify anything and everything I had uh, I had heard uh, because of my uh, access to intelligence sources. And uh, on the other hand, I said to myself, if I really have those gifts that my professors saw in me, then it would be it would be like self mutilation if I cut that talent ta off my record and of my uh, striving for professional status. And I said, I'm not going to do their work for them. And so I rested, I got to that decision and I found my reward in the generations and generations of German students who flocked to my lectures and who were receptive to what I had to say and stayed that way. So I, I feel good about my decision and I think even with the rise of anti-Semitism, now that I have a certain status in Germany, I can do what little a professional like me can do to help in defeat anti-Semitism and other prejudices. I recently got invitations by two state parliaments to talk about the very problem. And if the state parliamentarians were willing to listen to me and show um, by their applause that they liked what I had to say, I think I have done a job in Germany that few people could have equaled because of my, uh, of my reputation, my uh, commitment, and my arguments. And we have to celebrate the tremendous contribution you made in the United States, the contribution you made that the various universities you taught at, most especially your early career at Denison and your career at Cincinnati, and your um, enormously well-respected career uh, at Wayne State. We have to celebrate the fact that you did not retire from, but you retired to, and you've made a monumental contribution to the uh, Zeckelman Family Center and to the uh, museum. And a uh, guy, there is an entire public that wants to say many nice things to you. Uh, I'm going to take the liberty of saying that uh, if there's another occasion when we can go through the next uh, 22 minus 98, gives us uh, 76 years of additional life to go through, uh, I'd be happy to come back because I always enjoy spending time with my friend, but let me turn it back to, uh, to you. Okay, this is a fun part of the evening. Um, so I'll, I'll do a little bit of announcing, but what I'd like to do is at the bottom of your screens, there's um, a button that says raise hand. And if you'll raise your hand, then we'll let you into the uh, program one by one and you'll be able to wish personally uh, greetings to Guy just really briefly so that we can allow as many people as possible to do that. So um, let me just make a couple of announcements while we're waiting for people to raise their hands and we can start letting people in. So first of all, I wanna thank Michael uh, for um, doing the interview with, with Guy. Um, I wanna thank uh, Rob Mike Boskowitz uh, for his introduction and I want to thank again Wayne State University Press for printing this amazing book. Uh, please get your copy on our website, and um, and then encourage people to uh, to continue to to engage with us at the future programming. I'll tell you about as we um, go through the uh, the program now. So um, if we can pull up a couple of people who have um, raised their hands, let's pull a, a 
just uh, one or two of them into the group. We're going to start with Rabbi Mike. Um, if you can pull uh, Rabbi Mike in and open up his... Oh, you know what? We have Alan Zeckelman. I actually wanted to get to Alan first. We got a little bit ahead of ourselves. Alan, you want to uh, speak to Guy for a minute? I, I just want to quickly say, uh, Professor Stern, I have your book. I'm going to anxiously read it. And it's. I'm so proud to know you and to have uh, known you for these years. Uh, your contributions to... Uh, to, 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 to the world really are, are beyond uh, comparison. And, 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 and thank you so much for everything you've done. Thank you for choosing Detroit and, and all your involvement at the Holocaust Center has been just uh, monumentally formative. And, uh, and, 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 and I, I overheard Susanna remind you that you're married to a fine German woman, love of your life. And, uh, <laughs> and, uh, and, and of course, thank you, uh, Professor Birnbaum Rabbi, Professor Birnbaum Dr. Birnbaum for, for uh, emceeing today. And uh, Kola Kavod. Thanks very much, Alan. Um, let's see, I think we're gonna get Rabbi Mike back up onto the screen. Can we do that and have him give, give a little cheers to uh, to Guy? You see, I've dressed up for the occasion, Guy. I'm the host for the evening. There we go, Rabbi Mike. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah, I took off my coat. You put yours on. I mean, it's very impressive. And uh, thanks again for including me, Dr. Stern. Asked me to be part of this. Uh, again, always humbling in your presence because of your experiences, um, your work in uh, and teaching at Temple Shir Shalom. Over the years and always come back to this message of altruism and the importance of that uh, and something. And I wonder why is that something that you so focus on in your life and in your teaching and as uh, something we're always looking for? Yes, there are two aspects, uh, Michael, uh, to, to that. And one of them is to find out what makes human beings altruistic, which means acting against their own narrow interest and seeing the large, larger picture and becoming helpful to others. That's one, and there are many institutes that have done yeoman work uh, on, uh, on that score in finding the, uh, let's say, let's, uh, finding the incentive to do good work, even if it meant under a dictatorship that would immediately put them among the persecuted if they ever found out, as they did in many cases. And uh, that is one aspect. And the second aspect is to try to spread that idealism in the younger upcoming generations and make them perform uh, altruistic acts on their own and do, just to put it in, uh, in very simple terms, to do the right thing rather than the profitable thing. Thank you very much, Guy. Um, Margie, we've promoted you. You want to say a few words to Guy and Susanna, if you want to come into frame and you can also respond to some of these people. <laughs> Thank you so much for helping us on the tech side here also, Susanna, of getting all the- Hello. Hi. I just want to thank you so much. I, I'm a former Detroiter and I'm friends with Stephen Laurie Weisberg. And um, somehow or another, I got on your mailing list, which I'm very excited about. And I'm so happy I was able to join this tonight. And I found the presentation guy so beautiful, so wonderful. And I learned a lot. Thank you so much. Excellent. Thank you. So let me just remind everybody, thank you for that sort of lead in. Our next event is uh, Wednesday, September 2nd, about the aftermath of the Charlottesville uh, Unite the Right rallies. There's a, a film that we're going to be seeing together called Fighting Back Against Hatred and then a conversation with the filmmaker, Alexandra Horowitz, who's gonna be in conversation with one of the rabbis from the synagogue at the time there, Rabbi Rachel Schmelkin. So um, that's uh, something we're looking forward to. Let's see, Monica, uh, I think that uh, you're next. Go ahead, uh, greet uh, Guy and Susanna. Hi, Guy and Susanna. I just wanna say congratulations, Mazel Tov. I am so 
pleased for you to have finished your book. I know how hard you worked on it and um, you're just such an inspiration and I feel so honored and proud to be able to work alongside you every day. And I can't wait to have you come back to the center and be my morning buddy and greet me on the elevator. <laughs> okay, thank you. Leanne, you want to uh, send your greetings to, uh, to Guy? Sure. Um, hello, Dr. Stern and uh, Suzanne. Good to see you. Uh, at the Jewish Book Fair, they always have excellent intro, um, people who give excellent introductions to the speakers. And um, Dr. Stern gave an amazing introduction to one of the Book Fair participants. And um, I went up to him afterwards and I said, this is the first and only time the introduction, the introduction speaker, uh, or you, were, you were far more interesting than the speaker himself. And uh, the speaker was very, very good. So <laughs> to upstage the author was a uh, rare and uh, a wonderful experience. And so I'll never forget that, that day hearing you speak. Well, I thank you I'm, and congratulations. I must say that uh, most of the speakers that I have heard at the HMC, at the Holocaust Museum, and at JCC uh, outdid me in their uh, magnetism. But uh, thank you for being kind. And I also want to say my daughter is a, uh, start, is starting her junior year at Wayne State, and. My goal is to get my busy daughter to come meet you. It's a hard thing for a mom to do. When, when all of this trouble is over, we have open doors at the Holocaust Museum. Okay. I'd um, like to call on Paula Finkelstein to uh, give a greeting over to, to Guy and Susanna. Go ahead, Paula. Hi, Guy and Susanna. Remember me, Guy? I haven't seen you in a long while but I wanna wish you so well on the publication of your memoirs. And of course, I knew a bit about it because I've come to all your lectures at SOAR, but um, we're really gonna miss you. Are you gonna, if you're gonna do a class, I wanna make sure I'm in it. Um, but I just wanted to thank you for doing this book launch virtually tonight because it's really, really an interesting story. And the Invisible Ink is a wonderful, wonderful lesson for some of us to remember. So thank you very much. And thank you, uh, Rabbi Michael Berenbaum. Thank you so much for your good um, interview skills. It really helped a lot. Well, thank you. Thank you. And uh, I can say that this evening, this the arrangement both on the technical side and on the intellectual side, if any, uh, was uh, uh, was really done because we have a fantastic staff at the Holocaust Museum and they had arranged this minute by minute and had, uh, had stopped short to tell me what to say. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Guy. Um, Bernie Lubren, would you like to step up? Hello, Guy and Susanna. Uh, this is Bernie Lubrin. I am the president of the Friends of Camp Ritchie and also the son of a Ritchie boy. And I just wanted to tell you that the hundreds and hundreds of family members of Ritchie boys so appreciate everything you have done to bring awareness to the public, to the military intelligence community about the achievements and the heroic and patriotic deeds that the Ritchie boys had done. And we're doing everything we can to preserve that memory. And your book is just another great way for Americans to relearn as Michael Berenbaum spoke about the lessons that we all need to learn in history about using native speaking people for military intelligence and so many other lessons that the Ritchie boys taught. So thank you very much. Well, I can replace, replace that complimentary remark to you
because you have been a very worthy son of a very worthy father. Thank you. Thank you, Bernie, for joining us today. Um, Laurie Stevenson, want to uh, send some greetings to Guy and Susanna, go ahead. Hi, Guy. Hi, Susanna. Uh, to everyone out there, Guy is my uncle. I'm very pleased and proud, and I can't wait to read the book. And now that you guys can do Zoom, I expect to have a Zoom visit now and then because I can't come and visit you. So congratulations. I toast to you. Love you very much. We love you too. We only have water to toast. <laughs> okay. Love you. Love you too. Love you, dear. Uh, Cheryl Goodwin, if you would unmute your, your uh, connection. I also want to uh, remind everybody that our museum has reopened and uh, we have a temporary exhibit here, a special exhibit that's here through October on um, the uh, identification and capture of Adolf Eichmann. It's called Operation Finale. Really exciting. The last time it'll be in North America before it's disassembled. So welcome the, the public back to the building. You have to buy your tickets in advance. We've got all the safety procedures in place to keep our guests safe, but uh, we hope that you'll be able to come back and see it. Uh, Cheryl, go ahead. Hi, Guy. Um, I just uh, really enjoyed the lecture and um, I've been perusing the book. Um, hope you're doing well. I haven't seen you in a long time, so I just thought I'd say hi. Yes. Thank you very much. I thought you I was going to get searching questions, but you uh, you have just made my head swell a bit more. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, it, Doug says hi too. Hello, guy. Hi. Oh, wow. The couple is together. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. So, um so that the book is a real accomplishment. I'm I'm just really thrilled. Uh, do you plan on doing much more presentations at the Holocaust Museum or? Oh yeah, we're we're desperate to get as soon as we. Can. Sorry, uh, Frausbau, can we uh, have you unmute yourself and say a couple of words? There you go. Beth, go ahead. No, it's it's from me. Hi, Beth. Hello. <laughs> Beth, Beth, go ahead. Oh. Franco, go ahead. Yes. Uh, you remuted yourself after you started, then you remuted. You have to, Beth, you're, you're muted again. You have to start over. I'm sorry. Um, Thank you. Was. Sorry. How's that? You're right. Okay. Okay. Very sorry. Anyway, virtual hug to Guy and Susanna. It's so great to see you. And Guy, I've heard only bits and pieces of these stories over the years, so I'm just so beyond excited to be able to piece all the pieces together and fill them in. And, um, you know, there's always the saying that you cannot choose your relatives, but I think in your case, you were a chosen relative. <laughs> and we are thrilled that you've been part of this family. So... Very excited. Thank you. Thank you, Beth. <laughs> let me, let me, uh, Ellie, if you, if you want, let me do one more thing. I had the fun of writing a blurb on this. And when I wrote the blurb, I said, it is a remarkable and enviable achievement when a man who is now in his 10th decade writes a book that exceeds in quality and depth what he wrote in the folly of his youth a half century ago, in the years of his um, uh, biblical wisdom 30 years ago, and even in the years of his biblical strength 20 years ago. So the idea that a man your age is still a productive academic and writes such a book is something that we absolutely all must stand in awe of and most of us can stand in envy of, but it's a good envy. <laughs> uh, um, Mike, uh, I have a closing or near closing mm -hmm. remark to make. Uh, if uh, I, it, I was given two minutes for that, and I, you know, what you have learned uh, behind my back all about the Ritchie boys and about the colleges I attended and those were taught. That is an amazing piece of research on your part and probably enough for another book on that long list that you have, have parented. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. 
<laughs> okay, Michael, you got work cut out now. Helga, you want to say unmute yourself and say a couple of words? Go ahead. Hi, can you hear me? Yep. Uh, I just want to plug Guy's book. It's such a compelling read. I finished it in less than two days. Uh, I mean, I read pretty fast, I have to say, but it was so, so exciting and so well written. Um, it was amazing. It is an amazing book. And uh, I should explain that I'm here as uh, Guy's our president of the Penn Center for German Language Writers Abroad, and I'm his secretary. And uh, I haven't known Guy and Susanna for very long, uh, um, but it's been the most enjoyable um, meeting uh, that I've had in a long time and a little friendship has blossomed and I, uh, I hope to continue. We well, hope so too, and we enjoy your peaches every day right now. <laughs> Elga was so Don't do it again. And peaches. Thank you so yeah, much, Elga. Wonderful. You're welcome. <laughs> Gloria, you want to unmute yourself and uh, well, uh, I, I'll tell you something happened a couple of days ago. Uh, Susanna uh, shared with me a really noteworthy quotation from a book she was reading, uh, sitting uh, sitting at the same table with me. It was an observation by Mother Teresa, I quote, the biggest disease today is not leprosy or the tuberculosis, but rather the feeling of not belonging. When the Nazis came to power in Germany, I often felt that that very disease of not belonging gnawing at me. In later years, I occasionally had similar feelings. This evening, your overwhelming signs of genuine friendship have cured me. I feel I belong. Thank you very much for that. Very meaningful guy. Thank you for sharing that. Gloria, you have a couple of words? Yes. I mean, I, I first met you, Guy, under very different circumstances from everybody else here, as you know, and they weren't happy circumstances. They were sad circumstances. But I came to know you and to appreciate you, and you have been, you are, the conscience of Wayne State University. So <clears throat> congratulations on your book. And uh, I look forward to many more years of knowing you. So, Gloria, I thank you for those words. Uh, you uh, work at the Cancer Center, and it's good to have an ally there. Yes, thank you. Um, Steve Grant, you want to unmute yourself? Yeah, Guy Mazeltov on the book. Um, you know, I've heard your story more than once, but I must say I never heard the latrine part of it. <laughs> so I'll, I'll, yeah, I'll, I'll, that's when I'll remember for a long time. Uh, you know, listen, you've been integral to the Holocaust Center. You know, I, we, we've been there together for a lot of years. And without you in those trying times 10 years ago, I'm not sure we would have gotten through. You were a great, you know, aid to me. And and Alan and, and Gary and Michael and, you know, as interim CEO, you did yeoman's work. So uh, I'll always remember you for that. So congratulations again. Uh, Steve, it was a wonderful thing to have you at my side. And this is the appropriate time to uh, apologize to you for all the Sunday mornings that you uh, scrapped or scratched away from your golf engagement well I, i'll tell you without you we get we don't get through those sunday mornings so uh you were you were very integral to the whole process so that's page uh, 195 in the book for those of you who want to uh, read up on it um i have the uh, the kersners next if they could say a couple of words go ahead hello guy and susanna um hello <laughs> hello it's so wonderful to see you again. Um, I want to say that my father was a Ritchie boy with Guy and that I've known Guy for 65 years, I think. Um, he used to come to our house for dinners and it's just wonderful to see you and we look forward to reading the book. We haven't gotten it yet. 
<laughs> well, Eric, I knew you as a tyke. <laughs> a tiny one. It's true. I think I was five. Yes. <laughs> so all my all our best to you. Thank you. Thank you and the best and Thanks. good life for you. Okay. Let me Bye -bye. Very much. Let me ask uh, Mr. Kowalki if he could open up his um his you go biking? otherwise if you can I, I want to uh, thank everybody um, who participated today and remind everyone that uh, the support of the Holocaust Center um, to create events like this and continue mm -hmm. to do our important work and can ask you to consider becoming members and joining and in, in, in support of us as well. Um, Alvin and Harriet, if you want to say a couple of words and then we'll come to Mr. Kowalki. Well, I'm coming towards the end. I want to say for those who didn't read the book that one, I like someone else finished it in less than two days because I couldn't put it down. But I was amazed, absolutely amazed and almost stunned as the amount of detail you could remember. I think most of us can't remember yesterday, let alone today. And you have the ability of not only remembering the names, the places, the actions, the feelings that you had all those years ago. And I just want to compliment you on capturing that in the book so that we too could share just a piece of your life in ways that we didn't have to live it, but we can learn from it. So thank you, Guy, very much. And I certainly enjoyed the book, mm -hmm. and as Al did. I read Very it too, much. and one of these days I want to get together with you and talk about your experiences at Wayne. There's not enough said in the book about that, and I, I really want to talk about that sometime. But of course, my last question to you is, if now that it's published, what one thing would you have liked it to include? Just think about it. You may not be able to answer it right now. Is there something that didn't get written that you looked at it afterwards and said, why didn't I talk about that? What? The episode in the pancake house. Yes, I, I think <laughs> uh, once one thing oh. that uh, I have heard repeatedly from my good wife, and she okay. said, "Why didn't you?" What? Again, and that is that we uh, uh, re-enter sometimes our past in unforeseeable ways before, and that was. Uh, I was uh, peacefully having breakfast with a colleague, a high school teacher from um, midtown, uh, from downtown Detroit, and uh, and uh, uh, all of a sudden a waiter comes running in and he says, "There's a holdup man." at the jewelry store across uh, across this shopping center and uh, seems to be headed for us here. And so I uh, completely reverted to my master sergeant standing or non-standing. And uh, I, I said, down everybody on the floor, on your f on knees and, and arms. And they all listened as if so I was still a master sergeant and they were the uh, lower ranks and we all crawled out of a side entrance of the pancake house and so I thought some of the things that I learned in basic at Camp Ritchie and exercised later on during the war uh, suddenly came back and here I stand in a dual personality. So uh, that was a story, unless uh, Susanna wants to yeah. add anything to her recommendation. Uh, I, uh, that's one item in my repertoire I could have told and failed to do. And I have something for the sequel guy. We're good. Mr. Kowalki? Well, I just want, can you hear me? Oh, yes. Hi, Kim. <laughs> Good. Hello. Congratulations, Guy. And I think back to, I wasn't a Richie boy, obviously. No uh, courage uh, of that magnitude, but I'll never forget the day that we met on a bench uh, in the uh, plaza outside Lotta Lenya's apartment building 
and we decided that we would be comrades in arms in the pursuit of the <laughs> perpetuation of the legacy of Lenya and Vile. And I have enjoyed every minute of those 40 years that have intervened. And I've always counted you as my wisest counsel and one of my best buddies. Thank you so much. Thank you, Kim. But I have to tell you a secret now. When Lenya appointed me to the board, um, I uh, could hold my own on the literary parts of a musical work, but I understood absolutely nothing when, uh, when two people, uh, both members of the board, were talking across from me. I kept my mouth shut and didn't ask a question. I didn't dare, but that you folks were the inspiration for a, a self-taught course in music. I read everything that I thought pertinent. And today I, I do know what the reduced fifth is or <laughs> which which uh, really uh, made me wonder when they uh, you know whom our our conversationalists were and uh, I learned a heck of a lot and something just enters my mind when Guy and I had our first conversation after about 10 minutes we together sang songs from the three penny opera which i knew by heart and is my absolute favorite and that was such a strong bond there was no other way <laughs> for us to come together that's wonderful thank you um amanda a couple of words hi dr stern hi susanna i'm so happy to see the book finally out but I can't wait to see both of you and, and get your signature in my copy, Dr. Stern. <laughs> oh, he, she was my mainstay at the beginning and at the end of this adventure called Invisible Ink. Thank you very much, Amanda. Thank you. Uh, um, Lentis, do you want to unmute? And uh, you have to unmute first, and then we could hear what you have to, uh, to add for, for Dr. Stern. Um, Let's see, you have the, you see where your mute is on the lower left corner, if you can hit the mute and, and get your, your sound going. And um, if we could ask Barbara and Barry each to put their video on, we'll request those to go on so that they're next um, after you guys. I'm sorry we're not successful here in getting your, your mic going, uh, Linkies. Um, let's see if we can get the, another one of the participants to, um, to join us while you're trying to get your your mic on. Uh, Stacy, can you unmute yourself and um, we can start the, there we go. Hi, Dr. Stern and Susanna and Stacy. How are you guys? Hi. I'll, I'll be ever forever grateful for Selva Silverman in uh, 2006. She introduced Dr. Stern and I, I was a volunteer at the bookstore and she said, I think this is too little for you. I've got a job for you. And I was Dr. Stern's assistant off and on over the years. So my life is the richer for it, pun intended with Richie. So <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much and congratulations. I too cannot wait to get my copy signed by you and Susanna, even your um, book of poems. I would love to have that signed by you too. There is no book of poems yet only here in the US, one book with short stories. Yeah, Dr. Stern had talked about it. But uh, yeah, but thank you for mentioning it. <laughs> Great. Thank you Just so shut much. up on Amazon, Susanna. <laughs> um, please, go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Hear us? Oh, oh Dr. Hi. Stern, congratulations on a wonderful, wonderful book. I, I, I know that I met you a little later on in both of our lives, but uh, the fact that I was, I got to hear a lot of these stories first person on our travels back and forth to the VA. Uh, it's a treasure, and we're congratulating you, and we've got our copy, and it's a wonderful, wonderful story. What a wonderful life. Thank you. And, and I just want to say, Dr. Stern, that I always get to hear the stories after your adventures, and um, you tell them a lot better. 
<laughs> so thank you very much and congratulations <laughs> on your book. Thanks for being my liaison to the VA. It's been my honor, my honor, thank you. Thank you for joining us tonight. Um, sure. Barry, we can't get your video on, but I think you can give your, your uh, words directly if you'll go ahead and speak now. Barry Burke. Okay. <laughs> Your reference to the Ritchie boys uh, brought back memories of my German teacher at Wayne, uh, Dr. Dobbinghouse. You probably remember him. What was his name again, the professor? Dr. what? Dr. Dobbinghouse. Dr. Dobbinghouse. Uh, uh, yes, Ed. Uh, uh, it was an interesting story. At the end of the Hot War, World War II, you will remember uh, possibly in person still, so possibly by history books, uh, that we had a Cold War with the Soviet Union. And uh, as, so we needed recruits who were bi or trilingual. And one of, and so I got, when I got to Wayne State and I was appointed there as provost, by the president, Tom Bonner, uh, I found I, a familiar face there. And it was Dr. Dabringhaus, um, a fellow professor, and he had served in the army of occupation after his Ritchie boys' uh, closest performances, as, uh, as you mentioned uh, before, uh, Michael. And uh, he was charged with being the liaison to one of the worst German criminals, uh, war criminals uh, in, uh, in France. And uh, he, was, uh, he was astonished that we were using uh, in our war against, or Cold War against Russia, that we were using uh, a uh, German war criminal. And uh, I guess I have never figured out the good or the bad of it, but it was an unwise decision. And, but um, but Dabringhaus and I immediately got together, had a cup of coffee and uh, declared both of us as uh, heroes of, of the war just past. Wow, that is quite the story. Um, Gary Karp, um, we can call on, on, actually let's do the Pollux first and then we'll call on Gary. Uh, Gary will be our last, uh, our last uh, greeter. Go ahead, Pollux. Hi, Guy. Hi, Susanna. We're Bye. so, every time I see you, Guy, or hear you speak, um, I'm just constantly amazed at everything that's uh, up here. <laughs> just amazing. And um, yes, we have your book it's signed and Gary is in the middle of it. And I told you the other day, I peeked at um, the last chapter of Susanna. <laughs> and, <laughs> and Mazel Tov, we love you. And we're, I'm so glad that you, that in this, big world that you ended up at Temple and um, you ended up in Detroit and we're just honored to even know you. Oh, oh, we love you. Love you. <laughs> Thank you so much. We love you too. Oh. Somebody mentioned, Susanna, your book of short stories. We have signed copies of both of your books. <laughs> Unfortunately, <laughs> Having just recently moved, I haven't unpacked or found Susanna's book in unpacking yet. Lots of things. But uh, I, I, you know, I, we have it someplace, hopefully. Uh, <laughs> but I did have a question that was raised tonight and still not answered when I reading your book. What is 48 and 52? <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 do you have do you have an adding machine? <laughs> um, well, actually, you know, s since I majored in math in college, I can't add. So <laughs> but let's put it this way: it's the next stage. We'll celebrate. 
<laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, we'll come back. We'll come back in in a little bit less than two years and celebrate uh, forty eight and fifty two. There you go. Gary Karp is our last greeter here. Our our uh, fearsome president and fearless president. Go ahead, Gary. Well, thank you. First of all, to our Rabbi Dr. Professor Berenbaum, thank you for your contribution this evening as your knowledge and historical perspective really helped to highlight Guy's career, his travails, and more to come, as you've said. So thank you so much for being here this evening. And to Guy and Susanna, mazel tov to the both of you. I know it's it was a labor of love in putting the book together, many grueling hours, probably many stories. And uh, as one of the previous uh, people said, difficult to figure out what to put in, what not to put in, but I think you've mastered it. And to Guy, uh, I believe you know that um, my father, my late father had incredible respect for you. Um, you. You truly were one of his favorite people, somebody who he admired in every which way. And speaking on behalf of my mother, my brother, Judy, Brenda, and myself, we're just simply humbled to know you, to call you friend. I, for one, certainly have enjoyed the many hours of those short little stints, those vignettes of knowledge that you would impart to me with your effervescent smile and your storytelling skill, which are really unsurpassed in any which way. And uh, I encourage each and every person to read the book. And uh, anytime you get the opportunity to get a few minutes of Guy's wisdom and knowledge imparted upon you, take it because it truly is a treasure. So thank you. I have a counter question to you, Gary. If, uh, if uh, uh, Sibling rivalry um, makes you not want to respond. I'll honor that. But can you tell us how your brother and I also have a bond? Well, you know what? I think uh, for as much as, for as well as I know that, I think it better comes from you. If you, uh, you're, you're certainly welcome to. Okay. Last that. story, guy. Go for it. Well, I should tell it? Yes. Better coming from you. I, <laughs> Gary, as you know, I, uh, I, I all of a sudden discovered that the film that was made, the first film, which uh, also is full of coincidences, or uh, its genesis is full of the uh, coincidences, and then I found another coincidence right here at home. Namely, that your brother became one of the financiers for the book written on American intelligence um, by a German filmmaker, Christian Bauer. And your brother was instrumental on putting up the funds for the creation of that, uh, of that documentary. So say, greet him and greet everyone in your family uh, and uh, tell him uh, I, uh, I appreciate his appreciation of our story. Well, speaking on behalf of all of us, we are all happy to be part of anything Stern. <laughs> that, that's, that's a great wrap up to an evening. For those of you who did not have a chance to, um, to speak to Guy directly, if you'll send an email to events at holocaustcenter.org, we'll make sure that Guy gets your messages. Um, again, Michael, uh, thank you. Um, Dr. Uh, Dr. Brambaum, most appreciative for your time and efforts and looking forward to again having our meals together back when we can be on the same time zone together. Um, as this craziness kinds of winds down. And again, uh, thank you to Mike Moskowitz, to Rabbi Mike for uh, his introductions and Suzanne and Guy, thank you for sharing your evening with us. Really most appreciated. Thank you for all the wonderful preparation and uh, the dress rehearsals. <laughs> and it was fun, it was lovely, it was just perfectly organized. Thank and you. when you get a copy of this, you should read all of the comments in the chat room. Yeah, we're so, going to send them all. We'll, we'll see that because there's there is really very very know, nice. uh, nobody's dissented from this. <laughs> yeah. 
everybody, everybody really is expressing love and admiration. Yes. And that's the quality of who you guys are. Thank you all. Have a very good night. Thank, Thank you. you. You too. Bye-bye. 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 Yes. It's called the celebration.